she's uh, she's busy trying to make sure everybody's admitted into the room. And as you know, that's just a safety precaution so that we don't have um, any technical mishaps with attendees. But um, thank you, thank you so much for coming. As you see on the screen, the session is being recorded so that we can start putting some of our content up on our website. Um, my name is Vicki Coleman Gallagher, and I am the co-director of the Center for Refugee and Immigrant Success here at Cleveland State University. Uh, my co-director is Grace Huang. She is in route in her car, and she'll be live on the screen momentarily. Uh, we have been doing a couple different brown bags back in the spring, and uh, today we have the stories we tell, an overview of the immigrant and refugee literature in America by our colleague Jeff Karam, who is a professor and chair of the Department of English. Um, the next slide, we just give a quick overview of the history of our our center, the Center for Refugee and Immigrant Success. Um, uh, so we'll spend a little time with that. Uh, again, the co-directors, myself, we'll go over the mission and vision. Jeff will present. We'll have plenty of time, I believe, for Q and A. And um, my colleague Grace Wang, uh, again the co-director, she will close with some closing remarks. So the history <clears throat> is that we started in about 2016, and. You can find a little bit of this on csuohio.edu under Chris, C-R-I-S dot slash Chris. And we started in 2016 in the College of Business, the management department with four colleagues who we wrote a submission to a call for papers in a journal called the Journal of Vocational Behavior. And in academia, the journals are usually trying to encourage content and encourage investigation of topics that are not well studied. And the call for papers was in regard to refugees and immigrants in the workplace. And so we collaborated and were able to publish that journal article in 2018. And that was kind of the beginning of our enthusiasm and commitment to refugee and immigrant success. The uh, current 2021, uh, array of faculty will be on one of the future slides, but we are an interdisciplinary team of over or nearly 30 faculty, students and alumni, and we volunteer on our own as well as student projects. We are all engaged in some scholarship or investigation of this topic, as well as trying to integrate it into our teaching. The vision of our center is to be the nexus of collaborative and interdisciplinary production of thought and application of the social sciences and humanities in research-based practices. It's a hot word now, but fa faculty have been doing this for, for generations, but research-based practices to promote economic flourishing of refugees and immigrants in Northeast Ohio and beyond. And <clears throat> The mission is to, again, collaborate with scholars first and foremost, but understand the past, present, and future of the refugee and immigrant life in Northeast Ohio and again, uh, beyond. So the next slide briefly, briefly shows some of those who have showed interest and are starting to collaborate with us. Um, the management department had began this journey with uh, founding the center. And then there's a wonderful team of faculty throughout the university, as well as I mentioned before, students. We have an alumni, Sierra Davidson, who uh, was our, found our um, board of trustees representative and a student I met in Madrid who is working with me and coming to the state soon. Um, and again, I just wanted you to see the talent, film, social work, psychology, occupational therapy, counseling, history, uh, and on and on. So we're generating a lot of enthusiasm and really do want to be here for the community to support the great work that the refugee services groups are already doing and supplement that and be a partner in their efforts. So uh, real quick, the next slide, if you could, we'd love to hear a little bit about you. We're doing great at 37 attendees now, but if you could please put a little bit about yourself in the chat, if you'd like to, why are you interested in this? Um, and then we will also follow up with a, a survey to get your ideas and talk a little bit about some of our future programming. So uh, let me uh, quickly give a introduction of, <clears throat> I believe that's the next slide. <clears throat> so again, I mentioned the, uh, the speaker, Jeff Karam, the stories we tell. 
Uh, he is a professor and chair of the Department of English, but he's also an amazing colleague across campus. He's been active in faculty senate. He was the president of the union and has just been a tremendous asset to this institution. He is a proud alumni of Yale University and in American literature. So that's where he got his PhD. Uh, and he has a, a bachelor's in from Rice uh, university in English. And I'll let him tell you a little bit about all the great work that he's been doing uh, in this domain. So thank you. Without further ado, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Vicki, for that introduction. And, and I'll be brief about what I've done, because really, I want to give a chance for us to uh, have a Q&A and look at the, um, the immigrant and refugee history to our literature. But I'll first say that I have a personal investment in this because my grandfather came to the United States in 1918. Uh, fleeing the Ottoman Empire, who was occupying his uh, northern Lebanese village. So um, third generation American, but our family uh, history is deeply invested in um, migration and those who have had to leave in order to, uh, to leave their home country to find a safer place. My own literature, uh, my own literary work focuses on sort of the international aspects to American literature. My, my first book looked at uh, border literature in the U.S. South and Southwest. Obviously, Mexico is very important there. And my second book looked at uh, literature and connections between the Caribbean uh, and the United States. And more recently, I, I've been doing broader work that's connected to Arab American literature, as well as some other connections there. So I'm always looking at the ways in which our, our literature is always more international than I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of us know. And um, you know, pre-pandemic, that also gives me a good uh, a good reason to travel. But uh, right now, you can see I'm just zooming in from from my office here. Okay, so um, I wanted to say a little bit about the subject of the talk. Um, my family advised me, please keep out of puns. Don't put dad jokes in there. I know I've got some students out there; they can attest what a class with me is like. So I I've tried to cleanse this of that. But I do have a double meaning in my title. And um, you know, this is just what English professors do. So the stories we tell is gonna guide this talk in two different ways. Um, obviously, from the standpoint of immigrant voices and refugee voices, we wanna hear the stories they tell, both about their experience, their culture, and our country. Um, but there's another dimension to this that's I think really important, particularly in our current political and cultural moment. Storytelling isn't just for authors. It's not just writers who do that. We all tell stories uh, to ourselves, among ourselves, and from generation to generation. And nations tell stories, and those stories have power. Those stories have the power to include, they have the power to exclude, they have the power to count certain people as belonging in the country, um, and, and others as not. And, and I'm sure we've heard discussions um, around this in, in current cultural moments both with um, the immigration of, of our Afghan allies and the question of Haitian refugees on the Mexican border right now. So I'm gonna start out uh, by flashing back to, to the 80s, the era of Cindy Lauper and Madonna, um, because see, that's kind of was a dad joke. I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. But um, there are two really important historians who are at this point oldies but goodies, uh, Benedict Anderson and Eric Hobsbawm who kind of cracked open the field of history by explaining something that now seems really self-evident, but not, wasn't necessarily at the time. And that's that a lot of what we think of as history is not really, is not really objective. It's not something out there that we just find and pick up, even though we look at documents and archival materials, that um, what's out there is connected to, to storytelling. For lack of a better word, you could call it creative nonfiction. Um, so Benedict Anderson, uh, has a quote, and I'm going to give a quote from Hobsbawm. And these are, this is the last bit of literary theory or historical theory I'll give you. It's sort of like a little bit of medicine at the beginning here. Uh, this is Anderson. I propose the following definition of the nation. It is an imagined political community. Imagine because the members of even the smallest nation will never ever know most of their fellow members, meet them or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. And Hobsbawm says, Traditions, which appear or claim to be old, are often quite recent in origin and sometimes invented. Now, it's important to note that neither of these historians says that this is necessarily a bad thing, but it's something that we need to be honest about. So that if we're going to talk about the American past and a certain narrative of what we think it is, we have to acknowledge that that's a construction and that that construction can change. 
um, as we learn new information. And this is why I think immigrant and refugee literature is so important for our nation. And now I'm trying to get to the next slide. All right. So this is part of the key contributions. Immigrant and refugee literature helps us expand and re-envision our nation and our sense of community. And it can also challenge uh, invented traditions, I'll call them myths for the purpose of this talk, that can limit our conception of what our nation can be. So I'm gonna do a little myth busting. Um, hopefully I won't get a cease and desist from the show myth busters. So I'm just saying myth busting. I've changed the end of the word so I'm safe here from copyright infringement. We English professors try to be careful with our spelling there. And then I'm going to move to a more proactive discussion of what um, sort of a history of immigration and ref immigrant and refugee writers shows us about our nation's literary history. All right, so this is myth number one. And this almost seems um, like something that you can't argue with, but I think it, we, we should. American literature is native born. Immigrant and refugee literature are foreign to our tradition. Now, if you're speaking precisely about indigenous and Native American literatures, then this statement will hold up and I will support you on that if that's your specific definition. Um, and I can say more about that in Q&A because I do research on Native American literature, particularly on the borders in the Southwest. Um, but in most of our current um, cultural and political commentary, we get is more of this. 16. This is a poster from 2016, right? And we've got that rugged white cowboy and more white-headed eagles than you can fit into the poster almost. Um, when pe people say we want American literature for Americans at say a school board in Texas, and I say that with reverence as somebody who went to school in Texas, I love the state, but it's got a very complicated history with, with immigrants and refugees. Um, this is what folks mean in some cases. Let's return to that Western tradition um, of those American cowboys and other figures that are the quote unquote real um, America. So time to evaporate that myth if it hasn't already evaporated <laughs> in your mind already. These are, these are the Puritans. This is uh, a, a painting um, of the Mayflower in 1620. And indeed many uh, people who talk about American literature and American heritage, especially those who value the uh, Anglo-Saxon Protestant heritage look to the Mayflower as that founding moment. And with Thanksgiving coming up, right, this gets revisited um, you know, quite a bit. But let's remember, before they were conquerors and colonialists, and, and the Puritans uh, were a rough bunch. Uh, they, with the exception of Roger Williams, who was extremely tolerant and advocated for religious freedom, the Puritans really founded a theocracy um, and were extremely hostile to, to Native Americans in spite of our um, you know, Thanksgiving Day pageant imagery. But they were refugees. They escaped persecution because they descended from the Church of England and they were also expelled from the Netherlands um, who, who did not want them there either. So if people look back to that Anglo-Saxon Protestant past and say that is quote unquote, the real America, and I certainly don't think that's the case, it's part of it. Even that has a refugee and immigrant component. So people who value that heritage should honor the fact that they come from a refugee background and then be kind and welcoming to refugees since then. Now, sadly, that's not always the case. And this is a pattern we often see in American immigration history that generation after generation, immigrants who make it sometimes extend help to the next generation of immigrants, but they sometimes don't. Um, and from just the standpoint of pure literary production, really important 17th century texts came out of the Puritan tradition. The first poetry, which was published by uh, Anne Bradstreet and Edward Taylor, um, important reflections on religion and on the experience in the New World from Bradford and John Winthrop, and really the first linguistic guide to Native American languages by, by Roger Williams. Also, these all have Puritan sources. None of these writers were born in North America. And um, significantly, a lot of concepts that we cherish in American history and thought uh, radical individualism, self-reliance, the idea of American exceptionalism are traceable to the Purit Puritans. Exceptionalism there is the idea that America has a special destiny. Um, these have got Puritan origins, and I would add to that, they have refugee origins. Okay, so here's myth number two, and this is one that depending on your family dynamics, you may hear at the Thanksgiving table. 
My ancestors assimilated and became American, but these new immigrants are different and holding on to their culture. And, and this, to quote Disney, is a tale as old as time. I think this idea and keeps getting repeated um, in some conversations. Um, and I, you'll see, I'm really looking at the early phases in immigrant and refugee literature here. We'll move up to the present, towards the end of the presentation. But I wanna emphasize that from the start, it's, it's the past is never what people said it was, if you will. And let's take a look here. So this is an image of the melting pot. This is from the original playbill of 1908. The melting pot is the idea that all Americans fuse into one American identity. And it gets repackaged in different ways and different um, ideas. But in the scope of American literature of four to 500 years, this is a recent addition. Um, it's 1908. And it was contested almost as soon as it was put into place. This is kind of a gruesome image, I have to say. I don't know that I want <laughs> this. I like Lady Liberty here, but please, you know, keep, keep me out of that pot there. So in, if you look back to the earliest days, um, and I've got to hear the frontispiece from one of the first really important um, pieces of nonfiction about North America, it wasn't yet the United States. This is Hector St. John de Creve Kerr, Letters from an American Farmer. Um, Krev Kerr uh, was, it was a migrant uh, to and fro, the New World and the Old. He was from France, but published under Hector St. John. He hid his French name. Not exactly a pseudonym, just an abridgment, I guess we could say. He was fluent in both English and French. He wrote in both languages for audiences in America and Europe. And he was kind of one of the first, you might say, travel reporters, letting people know what farming, customs, the landscape um, in North America were like. And it's really important. He emphasizes the multilingual character of America. And he says, and so English professors like to do direct quotes here. He says that if you, you will travel through whole counties where not a word of English is spoken. And in the names, the language of the people, they retrace Germany. And he mentioned this in part, almost like a chamber of commerce ad say, German immigrants come, French immigrants come. You will find your native languages welcome here. So the idea that you may have heard in particular coming out of the 90s, that we should be an English only nation. From its beginning, we've been multilingual. And it, it's important to note, Krefker never complains about this. And he's, he's a French writer saying, it's great that German's everywhere. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a rare linguistic uh, alliance, at least in a European context. All right, another writer um, who speaks about, let's call it the immigrant legacy in early American literature, is Washington Irving. His uh, book, The Sketchbook, is widely credited as like the first major collection of fiction and essays. Um, it includes The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle, I think two uh, perennial favorites. Irving himself, like Krev Kerr, moved between Europe and America. Um, he was the son of immigrants and he traveled back to England to try to save his family business. It didn't work. I think if you were relying upon a writer to save your business, you know, Vicky, don't call me up. I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to help out in, in, in that. Um, and he wrote these very American stories while he was in England. So I guess he was a productive time for him, even if his family's business um, went bankrupt. So I wanted to say a little bit about Rip Van Winkle, because um, it's a story that I'm sure many of us know. There's a helpful image of Rip. It's um, the ultimate uh, husband trying to get out of the honeydew list story, right? Uh, Rip takes to the mountains with his dog, wants to go hunting to avoid doing chores. And he's approached by some mysterious men who invite him to have a drink and go bowling. It's, it's kind of like a weekend in Cleveland in 1975 or something like that. You know, there's just a lot fewer bowling alleys uh, around these days, but I think we've got Mahal's on the west side still. So for many of us, if you know the story, think about you know, he falls asleep after he drinks too much. For 30 years, he wakes up, he sees the nation transformed. But from an immigrant perspective, what's fascinating is what happens early in the story, which is that um, Irving really emphasizes the Dutch character to New York. Um, Rip, quote, lives in a little village of great antiquity, having been founded by some of the Dutch colonists with houses built of small yellow bricks brought from Holland. Right, And it's true that, that immigrants in, in ships would often let the ballast of the ship be literally building materials from the old country. Um, we have in the spelling, the village is the Catskill Mountains, K-A-A-T-S, uh, that's the Dutch spelling. And when Rip sees the mysterious mountain men, it reminds him of figures in an old Flemish painting. Um, 
I have to point out, and this is because I'm, my, I'm the son of, of, a, of a lawyer who worked his way through college as a bartender, um, the drink they give him is Holland's Gin. It's an old school like Jennifer. Um, so legacy of the old country there. And most significantly, the Dutch legacies are not a problem for anyone in the story or for Irving himself. And Irving was not a Dutch immigrant. Um, so if you look back at some of the earliest texts that are in anthologies about American literature, immigrant culture, non-English languages are present, and it's not a problem. That hostility comes much later in the game. So people who tell you, oh, it was always the case that English was first, or that people left their customs behind, the literature and history just don't bear that out. Myth number three. And this one is a little more complicated, and this is a, a springboard really into the second part of the talk. Immigration to America is a one-way street. Now, from the standpoint of what we know about immigration at present, we know that immigrants maintain contact with their culture by communication, remittances, and travel. Even in the case of refugees, if political circumstances change, many of them may travel back to visit, many of them may um, even resettle in their home country permanently if they can. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. Um, Krav Kerr and Irving, not, neither of them were refugees, but they moved back and forth between Europe and America. So even when it took a whole transatlantic voyage, people were still doing this. And the reason I put this out there is that sometimes in our current political climate, scholars from the right or commentators from the right or the left will often act as if immigration happens and then people stay here forever, for better or for worse. And I think there's almost a kind of national narcissism there and the assumption that once you're here, this is the only place you'll ever wanna be. So we have to figure out how to make it work for you. And, and it's more complicated than that. And uh, we'll see that with some of the writers we look at later in this talk. Uh, here's an image from 18, I think, 94, if I can squint and see the base, uh, the, the bottom of this. This is a lithograph of the inauguration of, of Lady Liberty. Um, and you can see here that um, this actually nicely shows the coming and going. So I think this is a nice emblem of how people migrate um, back and forth. But issue of immigration um, as a one-way street has, has another layer. And it has to do with the question of who is benefiting from immigration. Who is giving um, to whom? So I'm gonna give you a little quote here. This is Emma Lazarus, the famous poem, The New Colossus. Uh, I didn't reprint the whole thing, but I'm just giving you the second half. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Um, this is a really important piece of poetry. From the standpoint of someone who supports immigrant and refugee literature, I gotta tell you, it's not my favorite. I love sonnets. I teach sonnets all the time. What I don't like about this poem, but I do think this is important and it captures a certain sensibility, is that it is, it is extremely condescending. The assumption here is that immigrants need our help and they are the wretched. We've got the lamp, we have the golden door. Now, certainly America historically has had a tremendous amount of privilege and economic might a lot of things that it can offer. But I think um, my social science colleagues, uh, if we get to this in, in the Q&A, would support me in the notion that immigrants deeply enrich our country at, at every level. So um, my little comment here is <laughs> the Colossus needs immigrants. Immigration is not a one-way street in terms of contribution and empowerment. America not only gives to immigrants, but receives strength from them, which is a key theme in, in our literature. Um, so this is the pivot to the second part of the talk, where I'm going to go over uh, really a view from 10,000 feet over about 300 years of significant immigrant and refugee writers. It's, it's going to be like a, a very breakneck appetizer course. Um, no one of these authors will fully satisfy you, and that's good. I want this to kind of help you uh, broaden out and, and maybe want to find out more or follow up with an email for me. Um, I also have a couple of caveats here. Most all the writers on the list I have made, I didn't choose them, I didn't make them this way, but that's where they are. These are first generation immigrants. Now, you can come from an immigrant family and be a significant immigrant writer and, and you know, being raised at a young age and steeped in that culture. And many of our best writers have that experience. But I just wanted to emphasize the next 10 writers I'm talking about, none of them are native born, but they're still really important for American literature. And obviously, there's lots of writers who are generated from um, immigrant families and refugee families who contribute as well. 
Um, another really important thing, and this is really significant for recent trends in American historical studies, particularly in the South. On my list, I'm not including for this top, for this tent, I'm not including African American writers. The reason being that African Americans who are descended from slavery were not willing migrants. And I point that out in a way that should be obvious because there are some school boards in Texas that have repackaged slavery as just another kind of migrant labor, which is, is morally offensive and historically inaccurate. In fact, if you look at the writings of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacobs, Harriet Tubman, they are refugees and migrants in their own country, right? And that merits a whole separate discussion. So you're gonna see writers of color in this list um, and you will see writers of the African diaspora from the Caribbean or Africa who have come because they chose to come to North America. So um, there are other writers who've got foreign descent like Douglas and Jacobs. I'm not treating them as immigrants because uh, these are descendants of, of, of enslavement and, and I, I don't want to conflate the two. And that's an important ethical point for me. All right, now the next one's first writer, this might surprise you. All right, Thomas Paine. Um, I hope people have heard of Thomas Paine. Um, Thomas Paine is one of the most important figures in 18th century um, America. And he is one of the founding fathers. He wrote Common Sense, which is the first and most widely circulated publication calling for independence uh, from England. He was born in England. Um, the other founding fathers were not. He came to America in 1774 at age 37. By 18th century standards, he's almost an old man. Um, now, Payne wouldn't really qualify as a refugee, but he was born into a lower class family with limited prospects, and he had written actively against the English monarchy. In fact, one of the things that Payne was good at is whatever country he visited that wasn't the US, he tended to criticize monarchical institutions and eventually get kicked out. So he, he did that uh, later on in England uh, and in France. So he's persona non grata uh, throughout Europe. He did not sign the Declaration of Independence, but he won the hearts and minds of the colonies to support it. And um, you know, I would say only half jokingly that the two Englishmen most responsible for American independence are King George, because the colonists hated him, and Thomas Paine, because Thomas Paine was the voice of revolution that persuaded people to support independence. And he also was a significant articulator of the exceptionalist ideal, said we have it in our power to begin in the world again. So, I mean, I'll be honest with you, a lot of people I think don't even know that Thomas Paine is an immigrant. Um, and I think that's significant that right at the beginning, we've got an immigrant helping um, with our revolution. Okay, Jose Marti. Jose Marti is one of the most important writers in the Americas that people in North America um, probably haven't heard of. He was born in Cuba, but moved to the US in 1880, and he lived there for 15 years, really the bulk of his most productive uh, writing time. He published poetry and journalism about current events in the US and Latin America. And he's often been compared to Walt Whitman, to Ralph Waldo Emerson, Oliver Wendell Holmes. He's a really important uh, writer in Spanish. He did not translate his own work into English, but it was translated in, into English in his lifetime by, by others. Um, he was here for some of the most important periods in American history, and he wrote on a wide range of topics. He was there for the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge for Coney Island. He also wrote about labor movements and inequality in the US. He also wrote about beaches. He has some hilarious pieces about how New York beaches are not as good as Cuba's. And you know, I, I probably can't argue <laughs> with that, but uh, his, his journalism alone takes about eight volumes, extremely prolific. And he was very important for an essay called Our America, which really sought to bring a common cause among people of color in North America and in the Caribbean. He was a staunch activist for the rights of the indigenous, for rights of Afro-Cubans and African-Americans. He was one of the most vocal uh, critics of lynching um, in, in the 19th century. And he's also one of those writers who really is willing to, to put his body where his, uh, his uh, ideology and intellect is he died fighting for Cuba's independence from Spain in 1895. So if you talk about being an engaged writer, um, Marti is, is exceptional in that regard. He's also really funny. Hearing him write about Americans on the beach, is, it's, it's like something you would see um, in The Simpsons. You know, He seems to describe almost Homer Simpson as an American ideal before he's ever created. All righty, 
see I have a pop-up because I'm always focused on food. All right, Abraham Khan. Um, Abraham Khan is, is a bona fide refugee, a writer of, of, of the clearest and highest order. He was born near Vilnius, Lithuania, and he and his family fled anti-Semitic violence to come to the US in 1882. He was a socially active journalist who founded uh, the Jewish Daily Forward, which was in his time the most widely circulating Jewish periodical in the world. He wrote in both Yiddish and English. And I wanted to make special attention to his, his first novel. It's called Yekel, A Tale of the New York Ghetto. It's published in 1896. And this novel was groundbreaking in focusing on the urban immigrant experience and the neighborhood. So for any of you who've seen the independent, an independent film or read a memoir or something about growing up in this part of Cleveland or growing up in this part of New York City, Khan is the person who gets that started. And um, he's left an incredible legacy because if you're like, Yekel, is that like lentil? Yes. Yentil? Yes. Crossing Delancey sounds like this. Yes. I mean, just there's a huge, he is, he is the father of a whole generation of uh, generations of novels, not just Jewish American novels, but just novels that focus on what it's like to be in the old neighborhood and what it means to, to move outside of it. And a fun fact is that um, Yekel was made into a film called Hester Street in 1975. Uh, starring Carol Kane from Cleveland. And there you go. Uh, this was reissued a few years ago in a new restoration. So um, legacies from, from 1896, uh, 100 years later, connected to Cleveland. Okay, Sui Shin Far. Um, Sui Shin Far has a very complicated immigrant uh, history to get to the US. And she was born in England to a Chinese mother and an English father. Her family moved to Montreal in 1872 and the move to the US for better economic prospects in 1896. She lived primarily in Seattle and San Francisco uh, on the West Coast, obviously. And that's a place where as someone of Chinese descent, she could observe the experience of generations of Chinese American immigrants who occupy one of those most complicated niches in labor and cultural history uh, in America, on the, particularly on the West Coast. Um, she was one of the first writers to address directly in fiction anti-Asian prejudice and laws, both at the state and national levels. And as we know, um, you know, in our current experience, uh, we still have uh, that residue of anti-Asian uh, violence in the wake of uh, in the wake of COVID. And um, her, you know, if you look back at her, um, the beautiful uh, exotic cover. But there's a real political edge to her work, including In the Land of the Free, which is her best known story, which essentially talks about the irony that this suppression of Chinese immigrant rights is happening in a country that champions freedom. And, and she's certainly not the first writer to make that point. Frederick Douglass um, and, and Native American activists made that point uh, 50 years earlier, but she's a very articulate defender of, of the immigrant. Okay. We've, we've covered the East Coast and the West Coast, but we've got to represent the Midwest. Um, so this is Giants in the Earth by O.E. Rolvag. Uh, Rolvag was born in Norway and he came to the U.S. in 1896 and worked as a farmhand. Um, it's not gonna surprise you that working as a farmhand did not provide him enough money to go to college, but he had good support from uh, Lutheran churches and he attended college and got a, um, both a bachelor's and a master's degree. He wrote in Norwegian but work with translators to get his work into English. Giants in the Earth is a really important novel. And if you've read any of Willa Cather, um, they're kind of spiritual cousins or literary cousins in terms of their emphasis on the Midwestern immigrant experience. And something really important, this loops back to my focus on what immigrants contribute to American culture. Along with Cather, Rolvag forecast the future prosperity of the US because of the Midwest, right? This is not something people said in New York or San Francisco, but Rolvag saw in the farming work of the immigrants um, in the Midwest that we would have, I'm actually quoting Cather here, um, the breadbasket of the world. So there's a, a prophetic wisdom in understanding that immigrants aren't just gonna transform the landscape, they're gonna turn the United States into a world historical force. And indeed, one of the things that really sustained the US in World War II was the fact that we had such strong food production in comparison to other countries. No, no famines affecting our soldiers. And this is a personal favorite of mine, uh, Claude McKay. 
Um, Claude McKay is really central to my own research, so I'll try not to go on too long about McKay. McKay was born in Jamaica and came to New York in 1914. If you like the jazz age, if you like the Harlem Renaissance, um, if you're familiar with Langston Hughes, McKay is not his wingman, but his, but his equal, um, along with Zora Neale Hurston. McKay had an amazing ability to write both uh, superb prose and poetry, which is a rare uh, double feature. Um, you know, if anybody remembers Bo Jackson, it was like the Bo Jackson of literature in terms of doing multiple things really well. But um, Harlem Shadows in 1928 was widely understood as sort of the text that inaugurated the Harlem Renaissance. It wrote about jazz in the way that Langston Hughes wrote about blues. So it really combined the music of this uh, significant form, put it into print. Home to Harlem, also published in 1928, was the best-selling novel by a Black author in the 20s and remained so for several decades. Um, it was an international sensation. He was close friends, as I mentioned, with Hughes and Hurston. And this is the part that's so, so significant. He really valued his Jamaican roots, but his heritage was rarely acknowledged by his peers and publishers. If I pulled out an anthology now, there's a 50% chance that he's just described as an African-American writer with no mention of his Caribbean heritage. And, you know, I think that, that shows um, kind of a blindness that we might have that like once you're here and we love you, you're American. <laughs> but if you're not us, then you're foreign. And, and I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that you really couldn't have had the Harlem Renaissance and the Jazz Age without the contributions. He's only of, of migrants um, like McKay. All right, just a couple more and then we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, Julia Albert, more contemporary here. Uh, how the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accents. I, I love the art on that uh, cover, so that's why I put that there. Alvarez was born in New York, so I guess she technically doesn't fit my first generation description, um, but she was raised in the Dominican Republic. Uh, but her family fled persecution by the regime of Rafael Trujillo in 1960. So talking about the back and forth, that's where her family lived. Um, Trujillo, if you're not familiar with him, was one of the most brutal dictators uh, in America described by some as the Sauron of the Caribbean, if you will, for Lord of the Rings fans, uh, just in a sense of surveillance and, and terror. Alvarez is, is one of the most important uh, Latinx and feminist writers, uh, period, has published both poetry and novels. She also works as a teaching artist. And um, as you can tell from the title, How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accents, it's really a masterpiece about assimilation. And it also focuses on reclamation. It's a saga with multiple generations looking back to figure out how can I get back my Dominicanness? And uh, you know that's a quintessential immigrant um, experience. And lots of people outside of the Latino, Latina, or Latinx experience have looked to Alvarez as inspiration simply because that generational relationship is, is kind of a common theme uh, for immigrants. And I just wanted to put out this kind of a funny fact that I was just looking up to when I was putting together the presentation and trying to get uh, some cover art. This is now so widely taught that when you first pull this up on Amazon, you're gonna get a teacher's guide and like three different kinds of spark notes. So like, you know, you've made it if students are being made to read your book and they don't wanna read it, they wanna buy something else, right? Of course, you don't get the royalties from that, but that just kind of shows how canonical and important this is. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, she's one of the only writers on this list who's got the spark notes. That's like another layer of success. All right, Edwidge Dantica. Uh, Dantica was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and her family um, migrated to the U.S. in 71 to escape the Duvalier regime. Um, Duvalier was also a brutal dictator within, um, within the Caribbean. And Dantica is a master of short stories and novels who really focuses on the relationship of migrants, of migrants, not just between their home country and the US, but among other Caribbean islands. She has a really sharp eye for the global flow of humanity. Um, she's one of the most awarded authors in contemporary American literature. If you're familiar with the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards, that was her, which given down the street <laughs> in Cleveland that since 1933 for works that combat racism and work for social justice, the Annisfield Wolf was her first, uh, her first award. She has a MacArthur Genius Grant, and she's also in Oprah's book club. Now that's how you know you've made it too. When Oprah picks your book, that makes a big difference. And, and Oprah, to be frank, has excellent literary taste when it comes to immigrant and refugee literature. She's really helped create a platform for, for writers. Um, and Dante Ka, and I just mentioned this because 
immigrant writers don't just matter to their immigrant groups. She's written about the experience of being an immigrant artist um, in 2010, Create Dangerously. And a lot of writers uh, from younger generations have, have looked up to Dantika and drawn inspiration from her work. Okay, last one, Dino Mengestu. Um, Mengestu was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, during a time of civil war known as the Red Terror. And you can see with these most recent writers, these are folks fitting a very strong refugee profile, fleeing, di fleeing dictators or civil wars. His father fled, applied officially for asylum, and the family reunited in the U.S. in 1978. Mengestu is also a MacArthur Fellow, and he is one of the most widely read writers descended from East Africa. If you're familiar with um, Chimamanda Adichie or Chinua Achebe, there's a very strong Nigerian West African publishing presence. Um, Mengestu is distinct and being from the Horn of Africa and, and kind of giving voice to that, to that region. And his works have been translated quite widely. And the last point to make about Mengestu, and this goes towards the way that immigrants contribute to our vision, his fiction doesn't just talk about Ethiopian history um, or the immigrant experience. He is very focused on questions of urban decline, urban renewal, and the perils of gentrification. And, and he's not unique in this. But immigrant writers are often our best, let's say, reverse anthropologists for looking at what they see in our culture that we might be missing. And um, you know, some of the most poignant um, work that I've read about sort of old neighborhoods being overrun by uh, by hipsters <laughs> um, comes from Magestu writing about um, Brooklyn or, or Washington, uh, D.C. So I'm just going to give you another list of a few things because we'll save the PowerPoint. You can review it. And these are just a few other ones here. I mean, it, you could just see the sense of the writers out there. Um, we've got uh, Bread Givers, a novel from Poland, uh, Christ in Concrete from Italy, Nono Boy from Japan, The Woman Warrior from China, Dreaming in Cuban from Cuba, Native Speaker from South Korea, The Namesake from India, The Kite Runner from Afghanistan, The Devil's Highway from Mexico. And I had to end with my own country, sorry, my own home country with Layla Halaby's Once in a Promised Land. Uh, from Lebanon. And there's just, you know, I could make four or four more slot, four or five more slides just with these lists. So I invite you to, to write, uh, follow up. Um, wanted to end with the closing quote. This is, oh, well, I guess my closing quote uh, didn't, didn't make it into here. My apologies, but um, I'll just, I'll just put it out loud to you. Carlos Fuentes says, let us learn to see uh, I and me and he and she, right? Then see yourself in the other. And I think that's what immigrant literature can help us do is not only learn about others' experiences, but understand how we connect to them. And that can be transformative of our understanding, not just of our sense of self, but also of our country. And I think it makes us a stronger nation for it. Thank you. That was brilliant. And my apologies, I'm the one who missed that quote in the transfer of the materials to our template. Um, so we don't have a, a super structured Q&A time. Um, Grace and I are usually terrific at tag teaming. Uh, she's just a wonderful partner. Um, but uh, yeah, go ahead and there's reaction buttons down at the bottom. You could put a question in the chat, um, raise your hand with the reactions at the bottom of your screen. But I, I wanna say one thing real quick. I cannot stress enough the importance of the humanities in our higher education system. We cannot uh, follow that path of beginning to minimize some of those early important coursework and move them quickly to, to their, their major. We have to continue to try and have well-rounded American citizens and <laughs> immigrants who are going through our educational system. So that was brilliant. Thank you, Fred, uh, Frederick, Jeff. <laughs> he goes by Jeff. I go by all three, it's fine. You do. <laughs> Questions, comments. Well, you're all thinking uh, and coming up with some uh, questions. I do wanna point out something. I mentioned earlier, uh, Laura Torrio, and she is at Autonomous University of Madrid and her and I were working together uh, and are working together. She's volunteering with refugees in, in Madrid. And I wanted to speak quickly to Jeff's point about the what you had called narcissism uh, and to, to some degree our own ethnocentrism. 
the folks, the, the refugees, Im immigrants and migrant, migrants who are going to Spain are doing so because there's a tremendous draw and an amazing reputation of inclusion and, and nurturing and caring for, for their uh, refugees and immigrants and, and assimilation. I just, uh, if you wanted to speak to that real quick, Laura, I just, I was learned so much by being there with, with the faculty and with Laura, uh, but hearing the stories of the immigrants, refugees and migrants, um, they don't, they're not necessarily saying, I wish, I wish I could have gone to the US, <laughs> right? They're just, they're very grateful to be in Spain. Hi, Laura. Let's try, sorry to put you on the spot. Hi, how are you? Good. It was amazing that uh, uh, when she asked uh, then if they will ever thought about going to the US, uh, it was not an option for them. It's true that they were from the LGBT community, all the refugees. So maybe that's a good point to have in mind. Yeah. But it was surprising that nobody, even Jamaicans, uh, prefer to go to Spain than to go to a country as the US where uh, they could speak the same language as uh, yeah, it was, the US. Yeah, a huge aha moment. Because the biggest obstacle, as we know, is to learn a new language. So Laura is there helping them uh, learn Spanish because she's bilingual and speaks English um, and the Jamaicans speak English. She can help them with their Spanish. But they went to Spain because of the inclusiveness of the LGBT community in, in Madrid, which was just just a beautiful thing. I do see Elena. I'm curious in which course does Dr. Karam teach more in depth about the literature he just shared? So I just popped an answer in the chat there. And ah. yeah, I, 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 I feel bad having to be so cursory in this. And I apologize if I wasn't scholarly enough, uh, Elena. I'm probably trying to just give a huge overview here. But yeah, I, I do a course, uh, gen ed course connected to the Ennisfield Wolf Book Awards about literature and social justice. And that's not exclusively immigrant, but a lot of it is. If you look at who's won the Ennisfield Wolf Book Awards, there's, it's, it's a great roster of, of both um, native born and, and immigrant writers. I also do upper level courses under our multicultural heading that focus on immigration and, and literature. And if anybody wants the syllabus, just send me, uh, you know, send me a note and I'm always happy to, to, to share reading lists. I think Adrian had another question. Yeah. I'm teaching a course on colorism in African American literature and finding articles that expand colorism to immigration and passing as a challenge to immigrants. Is there literature on this phenomenon? No, this is a great question. Um, I'm not sure precisely what the scholarship is on that specific question um, because, you know, as you're noticing, this is kind of expanding an observation within the African American literary tradition into a broader context. Um, but certainly within the texts themselves, within the literary texts, this is often a very, a very common theme. Uh, in Shangri Li's native speaker, the main character, who is a son of a Korean immigrants, um, obviously can never quite look American, but he's, he spends uh, most of his childhood trying to perfect his speech so that he can win speech and debate competitions, things like that. So and he even becomes, he ends up becoming a spy. So the plot has a really good set of twists there. But the question of what, to what extent you can uh, be understood as American or, or not uh, is really important for Alvarez as well. Um, because the Garcia girls, uh, you know, within the Dominican experience, there are plenty of people who are uh, Latina, but will uh, look extremely white. And in losing their accents, they may simply be understood as just another American girl, if you will. So I think a lot of, a lot of writers look very specifically at that. Uh, Adichie does as well. Um, Adichie looks at the fact that if you're a Nigerian immigrant and you have a British accent, you might actually be kind of viewed as an immigrant with kind of a higher, um, you know, I'll put a big scare quotes, a higher value because you seem to have like an Oxbridge quality to you. So I think I think uh, immigrant literature is very carefully attuned to that really good point that you're making, Adrian.
Um, okay, Brian asks, how many of today's immigrants uh, are winding up unpublished but on social media? Will an English professor study these histories in a hundred years? This is, this is a source of persistent terror um, to, to me because I do archival work, I like paper. And there are actually, um, there's a real strong movement out there, particularly among po folks from underrepresented groups to figure out how can we create a digital archive? I mean, a lot of digital humanities focuses on, well, can we scan things that are in archives and make them widely available? But I think other folks have observed, and this is particularly true um, with very recent young immigrants. I mean, my, my social media presence, like, can disappear and there will be no great loss to the to the world but i think for people who are who are who are blogging who are tweeting who are writing about what it means to be a young person uh in the immigrant context i don't think we're losing a polished literary text we're losing the equivalent of like the diaries and journals that an anthropologist or historian would look at so i think there are um some scholars who are working to and kind of scholar activists to figure out how can we capture and save these? And I keep saying print them out, um, but you're right. I, I, that's a really good point. Um, and a lot of it, it depends upon sort of what we think counts in the world, right? If, if you print it out and put it in a university library, that creates a cachet that will cause scholars to look at it. If it's just in a corner of, of the um, uh, internet next to, next to a Bitcoin server, right? Will anybody ever find it, even if the server is still is still running there? Still running, yeah. Um, question from Kathleen. Uh, Dantica has written both novels and short stories. Yes, um, I would say for Dantica, the collection Everything Inside is what I would definitely recommend for short story collection. It's 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 virtuosic. It's recent, um, and it's it's really powerful. Her novel Breath, Eyes, Memory is, and, and I, you know, people can follow up and I can, you know, always send emails. Breath Eyes Memory is, is her first really well awarded novel. And it's, it's a novel kind of in stories. It tells, it's told from multiple points of view, but it works really well because it foregrounds sort of what to, what to descendants of Haiti think about Haiti in the United States. And then what are people in Haiti thinking about the United States? Um, so it's sort of, you get the, the point and counterpoint. Um, Allie asked the question, is there a connection between immigrant writers and Native American writers? Do these subsections of literature have similar features in their writings? Yes, I can tell Holly, you've got your good anthropology uh, eyes on here. This is really true in the American Southwest. Um, and I'm gonna be careful in, in using the word immigrant here because from the perspective of many um, Mexican writers who've lived in the Rio Grande Valley for generations, like who's an immigrant? You guys are who came from Dallas down here to settle. Um, my family's been here since the 1700s. But from the American perspective, if we think about Mexican Americans, a Mexican American culture has really powerful confluences and connections uh, with indigenous culture. And part of it has to do with how the Puritans were versus Catholic missionaries. Uh, Catholic missionaries were not a kind group either, uh, but they actually encouraged intermarriage, encouraged conversion. Um, this is why there's a much stronger indigenous presence in Mexico than there is in, in New York City. If you view someone as fundamentally other, um, it's much easier to expropriate their native lands and move them across the Mississippi. So I think there are really strong connections and very powerful syncretism in the American Southwest. In, in fact, to be honest, most writers in the current Native American canon also have uh, a strong component of, of Latino heritage, if not in their family, in their experience of having gone to say Catholic schools or worshiped at a Catholic church in that area. So that, that's a really good point, Hallie. So the next one from Hillary actually might be a good segue. Um, she asks, Following up on Adriana's question of looking for recommendations, I wonder if you have favorite works that direct us to the connection of literatures on migration and climate crisis, um, works in environmental change and crisis as part of the narrative. So um, we're hoping uh, to firm up our next speaker for next month, which will speak to that specifically. And then of course, um, Jeff can email you uh, the there you go, Grace, thank you. And I'm sure Grace was gonna do this unless there's one last urgent question um, 
Thank you, Hillary. Uh, Grace, did you want to wrap it up for us? We've got about five minutes remaining. There's one more question. All right, sure. Um, I want to thank Jeff. Um, you have done such an informative work that helped us to learn that as an immigrant country, we have actually a long history of immigrant and refugee literature. However, somehow in our mainstream culture, these rich and unique experiences were not often recognized and hidden in the literature field. And I'll give you an example. I came from education background in, in K-12 education system. In recent years, we just started to become more aware of the importance. So Jeff, your uh, presentation inspired us to appreciate literature from a, actually a wide variety of culture also. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I would like to have special thanks to Heather Schlosser. She has helped us all along to the event coordination, uh, technology support, and also uh, the marketing part. So we want to thank her for all the efforts that she's done. Important reminder, I listed in the chat area, our next brown bag is three weeks away, which is the October brown bag. And in this brown bag, our folks focus will be environmental refugee. This is something uh, Hillary just asked. So uh, we're excited to uh, present our speaker, Dr. Deirdre McGeehan. She is our former provost and also currently a professor in Loving College of Urban Affairs. And her specialty is actually in international and domestic migration. So um, another thing I wanna mention is we have a special Chris website and check out our website. All the brown back in the past, we already have the session there if you want to listen to the recording. So um, on behalf of the Chris team, um, I want to thank you so much for coming and we look forward to seeing you in the next round back. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Grace. And uh, real quick, I think we did decide not to do it on the 14th because the service awards were then. So we might be moving that to the 21st, but that'll be on our website. Okay. Okay. Any last thoughts? We got a few people still on. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Hi, Janet. <laughs>